Starting in verse 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The word of the Lord. Shall we pray, gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and I pray that we would tremble before your holiness, that we would not trifle with your word, but we would come with reverence and awe and wonder. The very thing that angels long to look at, they strain their neck to see the work and the plan of redemption that you are working in the midst of of our world. Father, it is you, the architect of redemption, who says, I am the good shepherd. I care for my sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Father, we confess that in the darkness of our sin, in a world that we have torn apart, we have marred our planet, we have severed relationships, we have corrupted our hearts, our societies and our civilizations are wicked and evil. But Father, in the midst of this corruption, we still retain the remnants of the image of God, the image of God that you have given us. Father, and we trust the promises of the gospel that said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Father, we trust the promise of the gospel that says to as many as believed in him, in the work of Christ on the cross, in his righteous life, his atoning death, and his physical resurrection, which declared the victory of God, that sin was defeated. And he has given us the promise that he is making all things new. We live in the world that we see things are not as they, are, they should be. But we, the Lord is working and transforming as Lord of the new creation, his church, to redeem a people for himself, that there will be a day when sin will be vanquished. And weeping and crying and pain will be no, no more. And the Father will gather his children into his house, his heirs, his sons and daughters for all eternity. Father and I, as we await that day, as we long and pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray that we would not grow impatient, that we would not grow apathetic and forgetful and and assuming things but we will work in our world to reach our friends and neighbors with the hope of the gospel, that your gospel will transform us, and because we have received grace and mercy from our God, we will extend grace and mercy, that we will reach the poor, the downtrodden, the vulnerable, and with the gospel. Father, that we will not just simply work to meet our the physical needs of our friends and neighbors, but we will show them through your word their greatest need, which is Christ. Father, inhabit us today. Give us your spirit that will provide clarity to understand and to know your word that we may go forth from here changed. Every day, repenting of our sin and believing in the gospel that you may be glorified in us. In your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated.
you're not already there, if you would go to Colossians chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 11 through 15 this morning. And we, as in Colossians chapter 2, and we in this world are in the midst of an epic struggle. There is a war that is raging in our midst between two kingdoms. The kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. The prince of darkness, grim, and the Lord of the new creation, Jesus Christ. The battle is raging, the lines are drawn, and brothers and sisters, the stakes are eternal. Yet this battle is not just a battle that is unseen between angels and demons and powers and principalities and cosmic unforeseen forces, but this war includes men and women that, who either pay allegiance to Christ or they fight against Christ, either willingly or unwill, unbeknownst to them. We uh, know from Ephesians chapter 2, Paul, who wrote Colossians, also wrote Ephesians, and he said this, and you, speaking to Christians, were dead in your trespasses and sin. This is your former way of life you once walked. And it's not just that you were sinful, but you had a sinful allegiance following the course of this world, which is in following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the, through the sons of disobedience. Scripture throughout tells us that every person is either for Christ or against him. They're either an enemy of Christ, dead in their trespasses in sin, following the prince of darknesses, or they are a child of God, alive in Christ, following the Lord of the new creation. Ocean Park, friends and visitors, you are either a lot fighting alongside Christ or whether you know it or not you're fighting against Christ you're either united to Christ as one or you are separated from him this is the very thing that Paul talked about last week in Colossians 2 8 through 10 he wrote to protect the Colossians from the dangers of counterfeit gods that sought to lure them away from the one true God, Lord of creation and Lord of new creation, by offering satisfaction in fullness. And they whispered to the sheep, this is not enough, you need more, and it's out there. It's outside the sheepfold, unbeknownst to the sheep, it was wolves that were waiting, wolves that were wrapped in sheep's clothing. And all of this is from last week is also connected to this week. Probably if I was a better preacher, I could put them all together in a nice tidy package, but I've only been doing this for a few years, so this is what you got. You got two separate sermons. So this morning we see in verses 11 through 15, Paul draws our attention away from the dangers of counterfeit gods, and now he shines his spotlight on the cross in all its beauty and majesty, and he steps back and wants you to see it and be captivated by it, to see the work that Christ has done on the cross to unite us to him and to deliver us from our enemies and our bondage of the kingdom of this world. We are united to Christ. If you are a Christian, if your faith is in Jesus, you are united to his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Now, you may be thinking, what does that matter? That's just some theological mumbo-jumbo that you got in some big, thick book that was written hundreds of years by an old dead guy. What does that matter? It matters all the world. If you are connected to Christ, united to him as one, separated and delivered by him, either Jesus is the source for everything, or you have to continue searching in this world for something to hold on to. In the words of Jefferson, in your pursuit of happiness. 
the Colossians were being told that faith in Jesus on the cross is not enough. You need to be circumcised. You need to eat a certain way. You need to do or not do certain things. And only then will you be able to claim the promises of God. The false teachers were saying you can't have fullness in life. You can't have satisfaction unless you do more. You do more than what Christ has done. Today we face those same temptations, though they may be wrapped and look a little different. We are told that the cross is important. It's important enough to wear it around our necks, but we need to do more. The cross opens the door, but you have to walk through it. We think that the cross is good, but there's more that we need to achieve and more that we need to do and more that we need to know. We spend hundreds of dollars on podcasts and books and going to conferences that make claims they possess some kind of secret knowledge um, and hidden formulas that you can unlock the secrets of Scripture. That if you get this knowledge, this formula, you can amass wealth and happiness and success. And we believe the cross is important, but I need all this stuff. So what do we do? We stockpile possessions. We look a certain way. We do a lots of works. We try to build a reputation. We try to find a functional Savior that will make us feel good or help us escape our problems only to find that this pursuit of happiness can never fulfill us because we're chasing after the wind when the fountain of true, lasting joy is only found in Christ. The wells that we dig to try to satisfy our thirst can never satisfy us. Ocean Park, every time you try to add to what Christ has done, we are saying that being united to Christ is not enough. That you need to do more. I need more. I need to know something. I need to do something. This is the very thing that in our Sunday school class that Jared Wilson says. He says, where every other religion or philosophy of this world wants to give us things to do for our salvation, only Christianity says this, you can't do it. But Jesus did it for you. If you're taking notes, that's a really good thing. You can't do it. Jesus did it for you. The gospel stops when we start doing. If you're trying to prove your worth to God, if you're trying to cover your bases or find more, you are ignoring the promise of the gospel that says this. Everything you need for fullness of life was accomplished at the cross. Let me say it again. Everything you need for fullness of life was accomplished at the cross. Cling to the cross. Unite yourself with Christ. We know from this text two truths. This is uh, behind me on the wall. You are one with Christ, and you've been one by Christ. See what I did there? Those homonyms? You've been one, you are one with Christ, and you've been one by Christ. The good news of the gospel is that everything you need, holy cow, I hate it. That's not good. I, yeah, there goes... Andrew, would you go back and put it back to where it was? Put it on the, um, on the two bullet points. And I'll try to be gentle with the remote. I'll let me, if, if you've got all the slides, that's pretty much the sermon, so we can go home, right? Don't say amen. That's not nice. Back, you're one with Christ because you've been one with Christ. Everything you need for life and salvation has been accomplished at the cross. 
You are one with Christ, brothers and sisters, friends, visitors, if your faith is in Christ alone. Notice verse 11 and 12. You are one with Christ. You have become one with His death, His burial, and His resurrection. You are one with Christ in death. In Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now in the Old Testament, the, circ- the, the rite of circumcision was um, a sign that you have been made a benefactor of the covenant promises of Abraham. It was a ceremonial removal of a small portion of flesh to be able to be included in the benefits of God's chosen people. However, as you see, and as Scott read for us this morning, circumcision was not merely outward in an out, out physical ritual that you would, the sons of Israel would do, but it was an inner transformation that God also accomplished, and the inner transformation was more significant than the outer ritual. Because all we see throughout the Old Testament is many people who had the outward ritual, but their hearts were corrupt and wretched, and they did not have faith. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all uh, that you may live. Have you heard that before? Jesus himself told us this verse. Jeremiah, uh, later on in Jeremiah 4, 4, God calls them to circumcise yourself to the Lord. The removal of the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evilness of your deeds. Following along with the line of Moses and Jeremiah, Paul, a Jew himself, was saying and emphasizing the inner circumcision of the heart Uh, A circumcision that is not made by hands that we see in verse 11, but it's made without hands. Genuine circumcision is the Spirit of God working in the heart, taking off the spirit of flesh from all believers' hearts. In other words, the Spirit of God cuts away the former sinful life that drove you away from God in rebellion and brought you near to himself and embraced you with his covenant purposes and his covenant love. Though we recognize in our life sin still remains and sin influences us because we are, have these bodies of flesh, there's this inward transformation that is beginning that we are becoming more like Jesus, that we have been one with Christ, united to his death. And this is where the circumcision of the heart happens, is that this we are joined by Christ's death and the removal of this former reign of sin that controlled us. Notice in Romans 6 from our responsive reading, we know that our old self was what? Crucified. With him, who? Jesus. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. This former reign of sin that controlled us and held us in bondage, the cross has brought to an end. So that we may no longer be enslaved, though we're influenced Until that day when sin is ultimately defeated, we are free and enabled by the Holy Spirit to overcome sin because of that transformation that is happening. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Ocean Park, those who experience the circumcision of Christ have been removed from solidarity with sin and been united to Christ as one, one with his death because we are one and freed from his reign. Not only are you one with Christ in death, but you're one with Christ in burial. Verse 12, the beginning, having been buried with him in baptism. A few months ago, I took a little boy, um, a young man, I should say, to Chick-fil-A to talk about baptism and over a chicken sandwich and an ice cream cone. And I asked him, I said, do you know why we dunk people under the water and then pull them back out. 
And he thought about it, and he ummed and awed for a second, and he says, I'm really not sure. So I explained, when we watch a person being baptized, we are watching the dramatization of the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. Death, burial, and life. When a person goes into the water, they are literally a dead man walking. Their old self and that old rain is going into the water. And then what we do is we bury them, we lay them down symbolically into the waters of baptism, and they are dying symbolically to themselves. They are saying that new or that old way of life, the old Chris is no longer in charge. The old Chris that desires to live for himself and live according to his laws and his wisdom, I am dying to myself when we bury them in baptism. And then we lift them back up out of the water. They are arising symbolically with a new life as a new person transformed and regenerated and born again by God himself, united to him by faith. And as they leave that water, they are leaving to go and follow Christ and make disciples of all nations. I want you to listen to this next sentence. It's really important. Baptism is not what you do for God. Baptism is recognizing what God has done in you. Baptism is what, not what you do for God. It, baptism is recognizing what God has done for you. Spiritual circumcision has happened in your heart. And you are laying yourself down to the authority of your own right and your own pride and your own kingdom. And you're saying, I have died to myself because I have been regenerated by Christ and I am rising in new life because of the work that the Holy Spirit has done in my heart. Now, it's important to note, since we're talking about baptism and we think baptism is important, we put it in our name, baptism does not save you. Baptism, though, is an essential part of a believer's response to the, to the, to the gospel. Uh, an unbaptized believer is an oxymoron, like a soldier without a uniform, like a football game without a football. Baptism is a necessary sign of the new covenant, which signifies that a person has been united to Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection. To refuse the sign of the new covenant of Christ means that you don't either understand the gospel or you're not a follower of Jesus like you say you are. If you have not followed Christ in baptism, I want you to think about why. Is it because you don't understand? Is it because you don't really trust and you don't want people to know? Baptism is the outward recognizing that God has regenerated and worked a spiritual circumcision in your heart, that there is new life, and this is the outward manifestation of that. It is the public demonstration that your old sinful identity has been judged and condemned and executed with Christ on the cross, and it no longer holds authority over you. That the wages of sin, which is death, was paid by Christ. As the song says, my sin, not in part, but in whole, was nailed to the cross, and I own it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. You probably should have sang that one. I'm actually quote, quoting a lot of songs today. <laughs> the watery grave of baptism symbolizes that the Spirit of God has accomplished what the Spirit of God has accomplished in your heart. It says, I have been crucified with Christ in what? I no longer live. The old man, the old woman, is dead. It's, if we have been buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Your old sinful identity is a thing of the past and laid in the grave, buried to rise no more. It is no longer the reigning influence in your life because you are one with Christ in his burial. You are one with Christ in his death, and we are one with Christ 
in resurrection. Notice the last half of verse 12. In which you are also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Those who are united to Christ by the circumcision of the heart have been buried with him in his baptism and in his death and experience the fullness of life that is in Christ today. When Jesus rose from the dead, he conquered death. His resurrection gives life to all who put their faith in him. That former allegiance and that reign of sin is dead, and we have a new allegiance that we pledge, and that allegiance is to Jesus Christ, who is the source of our life. Those who are born again have experienced that spiritual circumcision. They have died to their sin. They have been risen to new life. They are a new person, a new creation. They're no longer who they were. Bondage to sin, and they have been delivered from that reign. Their former self lies buried with Christ in the tomb. We go back to Galatians chapter 2. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but what? Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. For God so loved the world. Christ, we love God because he first loved us and gave himself for me. Brothers and sisters, 2 Corinthians 5.17 promises of this as well. As we still struggle with those old temptations, those old addictions, those things that still nag at us, those counterfeit gods, those, those functional saviors that our flesh desires and cries out for, Jesus says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You do not, are, and you are not, under the bondage of that old life. Christ gives you the power, but brothers and sisters, our old sin and our old life is tricky. It's a rascal. And it will exploit us and struggle with us and tempt us and whisper lies to us to tell us to go after those things. But the old has passed away. You're no longer held in bondage. The new has come. We know that this new life has taken place within the heart. How do we know that this life has taken place within the heart of a person? The first sign that spiritual life is present is faith. At the end of verse 12, in which you were also raised with him. How? Through faith. I like to use this example of faith. Faith is akin to a seedling that breaks through the top of the soil for the first time. We often see people make a profession. We preach the gospel. We call them to respond. They trust in the gospel. And boop, out drop pops this little seedling for all the world to see. But the reality is, this may be the first time we see this faith on the outside, but the reason that that soil has been moved and the sap seedling has popped out is because life has been happening underground, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks. The, the, the life has been churning in that seed, and germination and, and life has been happening. People believe that spiritual life is the reward for those who have faith in the gospel. And said, faith is the evidence that the secret life-giving work of God's Spirit has been accomplished in a person's heart. How do we know that somebody is born again? Genuine faith comes forth. And with faith comes forth good works and fruit as it begins to manifest itself. And like the soils, it grows and it works and it brings forth fruit 30 and 60 and 90 folds. Without the life-giving work of Christ, a person will yawn at the offer of infinite joy that is given in Christ when he says, follow me. The light will be on in nobody home. How many times have you shared the gospel and you're like, man, I made Billy Graham look bad and how I'd shared that and nothing. And how many times have you walked away and said, I blew it. I couldn't even find John 3.16 anywhere in the Old Testament. That was awful. But the thing is, it's not about us. 
It's about the power of the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of men and women, and we come along with the water of the Word of God and the Gospel, and we call them to repent and believe, and the Spirit causes things to grow. And when the Spirit causes life to grow, faith comes forth, and good works come forth, and trusting in Christ comes forth out of that soil. Again, this is why we believe that the sign of baptism is reserved for only believers. An infant is not capable of professing faith, therefore we reserve the sign of baptism for those who profess faith in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The new covenant is unlike the old covenant and the fact that only those who have the circumcision of the heart that is wrought by Christ have been um, been raised with Christ and are a part of that that covenant. Therefore, the sign of the covenant is only those who possess faith in Jesus Christ. And we pray that we are faithful fathers and mothers grandmothers and grandfathers, friends and neighbors, that we will share the gospel of the covenant of Jesus Christ and his blood and his body that was shed for us, that the Lord would cause the hearts of our children to grow and love Christ and respond to his gospel. Ocean Park, you have been given fullness of life because you have been united to Christ and his death and his burial, and his resurrection. Just as Christ rose from the dead and lives today, you have been given the freedom of a new spiritual life because you are one with Christ in his, um, in his resurrection. You are one in his death, and his burial, and resurrection. And because of that, everything you need for fullness of life was accomplished at the cross. You have been, you are one with Christ, and you've been one by Christ. The shock waves of Christ's death and burial and resurrection still reverberate today, some 2,000 years after the event, and it has a profound significance of all those who are united to Christ as one. For it is Christ's work on the cross. For those who are united is one with him that you were made alive that you were given forgiveness, and that you were liberated from the tyranny of sin. Notice how you have been won by Christ and made alive in verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, notice what being one with Christ and how it has accomplished as the cross has done. You, God made alive together with him. Without your union with the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ, you are dead. You are not mostly dead. You are dead, completely stone cold dead. You are overwhelmed by the sinful reign of the spiritual death, standing condemned before the almighty judge of the universe. The spiritual uncircumcision of your heart causes you to run from God and you do not desire him because the natural man does not desire the things of the Lord. Your eyes were blind. You could not see the beauty of Christ. Your ears are deaf. You cannot hear the soothing melody of the gospel. You cannot hear the voice of the good shepherd that calls out to you. And your heart was stone. You were callous to the misery and the hopelessness of your plight. And you were unmoved by the offer of grace and the promise of the gospel. Yet when God circumcised your heart, he united you to Christ's death and his burial and his resurrection, and he breathed new life into your dead heart as he breathed life into the dust of the earth and brought forth Adam. When that happened, this victory that was accomplished by the deliverance of Christ on the cross, the scales of sin that covered your eyes fell away so you could see the truth for what it was. Your ears were cleared and you were enabled to hear the voice of Jesus that says, follow me. Your heart of stone was replaced by a heart of flesh. Now a heart of flesh that hates your sin and it desires the things of the Lord. This new life causes you to have faith that is deeper and love to abound and a hope that grows with each new day. 
John Wesley, in his great song, And Can It Be? It so happens we have it in the brown books, but this stanza that I'm about to quote from you is not in the brown books, which is a great travesty, and you need to know it. So here it is. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in nature's night. Thine eyes diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Ocean Park, being, one, being made one with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection has made you come alive from the spiritual sleep of death. Because you have been made alive, you are free to live life now to the fullest because you no longer get what you deserve, but you get the grace and mercy of God and you are free to enjoy the goodness of his creation as we await for Christ's return. In a world that is always seeking the full life, believers only are the only ones who can now truly have genuine life. Why? Because you've been won by Christ from death to life. Not only have you been won from Christ out of death and made alive, but you've been forgiven. Notice the latter half of 13 and and verse 14. Having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. When a criminal stands before trial, the prosecuting attorney will bring forth the evidence to the judge and to the jury to prove the guilt of the, of the defendant. We have watched so many times over this cable news, we have seen high-profile cases where um, attorneys have brought eyewitnesses and field experts and photos and documents and miscellaneous items. They brought the murder weapons, all these kind of things. Why? To prove the guilt of the one that is on in, uh, the defendant. This is the very thing that Paul is using here to show the picture of the hopelessness of our guilt and the power of the cross that delivers us from that guilt. We stand guilty before God. Every bitter thought and every evil deed is piled high and wide before the court, and it's easy case. We know the jury will not deliberate long, if and ever, because our sin and guilt is so high and so deep. However, your union as one with Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection has set you free, has declared you innocent. And as J.B. Phillips has said this, Jesus has forgiven you of all your sins. Christ has utterly wiped away the damning evidence of broken laws and commandments which always hung over your head and has completely annulled it. How? By nailing it to the cross above his head. When Jesus died on the cross, there were no sins above his head that were his own. It was our sin that was nailed above his head. Our condemnation our guilt, our shame was put above Christ's head and it was paid in full. Ocean Park, when you were united with one as Christ, he took your guilt, he took your condemnation, he took your shame and he nailed it to the cross. You have been delivered from the guilt and the condemnation and they have rendered it gone. I love how Luther puts this He says this, he says, so when the devil, to speaking to believers who struggle with my past, the mistakes, he says, when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares to you, you deserve death and you deserve hell, tell him this, I admit I deserve death and I deserve hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, I shall be. 
So brothers and sisters, when you are tempted and you are told you are not worthy of heaven, say, you're absolutely right. But my guilt and my debt and my shame was forgiven when Christ was nailed to the cross. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Being made one with Christ in His death and His burial and resurrection, He has delivered you from condemnation and the sentence of death that was rendered against you. You can now boldly embrace Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Why? Because you have been won by Christ from condemnation to forgiveness. And finally, the third aspect of your of Christ's victory and deliverance at the cross as you have been liberated in verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. After the German invasion in Poland in 1939, Hans Frank was appointed the governor general of occupied Poland. He was an enthusiastic proponent of the Nazi racist ideology, and he ordered the hundreds of thousands of Poles to be executed, all of their property confiscated, and those who were not executed were shipped to Germany to the concentration camps. History tells us that before the German invasion, there were either two and a half to three and a half million Jews in Poland. When the war was over, there was 103,000. You see the vast wickedness and evil of the Nazi regime just in Poland. He wrote in his journal, which was turned over at Nuremberg, he said, if I put up a poster for every seven Poles that were shot, the forest of Poland would not be sufficient to manufacture the paper for such posters. You see the tyrannical reign of wickedness in this man. On May 4th, 1945, his reign of terror ended when he was captured by U.S. troops. And he was humiliated in his capture because the once powerful butcher of Poland was now defeated and shamed and powerless. In his shame, he attempted suicide unsuccessfully twice. And he stood at Nuremberg before the world to be condemned as a broken criminal, defenseless and defeated. The power and cruelty of Hans Frank and the other 20 Nazis that were tried at Nuremberg are not in comparison to the tyrannical reign of sin, of the powers and authorities of darkness that have reigned in our world, causing sin and darkness and destruction in their wake. But just as Frank lost his power by the U.S. troops, the reign and power of sin was defeated that Friday afternoon when Christ was nailed to the cross. You see, those cruel tyrants of wickedness who mercilessly stole and killed and destroyed this world thought they had won when they drug Jesus through the streets of Jerusalem. They stripped him naked and they mocked and spit and they held him with scorn and contempt and they nailed him to the cross against trumped up charges. Yet all along, Jesus was accomplishing their destruction and our salvation with every new nail that was plunged through the hands and feet of our Savior. God put them to public shame to show them how utterly impotent they were by by Christ's love and forgiveness and how helpless they were to deter the, the divine power that raises the dead. Brothers and sisters, if you are one with Christ, a change of errors has happened. E-R-A-S. You are no longer under the reign and tyranny of sin, but you are under the reign of Jesus Christ. His kingdom which will reign forever. And you can sing the words of Luther, the prince of darkness grim. We tremble not for him. His his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Ocean Park, you do not need to fear the powers and authorities of this world because at the cross, 
You have been united as one with Christ, and you have been won by Christ. Fullness of joy is in Christ, and you can grow and flourish and lift high the name of Jesus Christ because you have been won by Christ, delivered from domination of sin and to deliverance and freedom in Christ, and have confidence that everything you need for fullness of life was accomplished at the cross, and you can say, Jesus, hold me near the cross. Be my glory ever. Till my raptured soul shall sing life beyond the river.